Good evening. Uh, we are the Cambridge Skeptics, a volunteer organization based in Cambridge in the UK, uh, as opposed to Cambridge elsewhere. Uh, and we are dedicated Uh, techniques seven and um, <clears throat> a couple of people named Pascal uh, deep time and Martin McKee wrote a paper on the idea in 2009 and basically it's the idea that um, all forms of science denial have a lot of things in common and uh, in this case uh, they're summed up by the acronym of flick which stands for fake experts logical fallacies impossible expectations cherry picking and conspiracy theories uh so we're gonna go through and have a look at them um first of all though i want to uh, start by defining some terms so obviously we're going to be looking at science denial so i thought it'd be a good idea to start by defining science so um would any of you like to have a a, a stab at how would you define science uh, i would describe it as a um a means of examining and identifying things about the world. Okay, I feel like cool. there's definitely a thing about falsifiable hypotheses mm. uh, in the definition of science. Chris, you probably like teach this all the time. You probably know exactly what it is. Um, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it's, 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 a process. it's a process. I remember that one, but yeah. Okay, yeah, um, process. Yeah. Well, falsification was key. That was the well, one yeah, that Popper, Popper came up with, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, why am I not sniffing, going over to my next slide? Because there's a cat on the screen. On the keyboard. Off the keyboard. <laughs> this is this is highly professional here. My cat has just closed the presentation, I think. Okay. Why can I not skip over to my next is slide? Is the cat a science denialist? Yeah, probably. Really there we go. Okay. So um this is a definition of uh science that I like. Uh, science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence and there's a number of uh, sort of steps below that um you know talking about critical analysis looking at evidence uh having experimental approach um obviously combining falsification is not on there falsification isn't isn't on there um that's the no, one we got the one we got's not on there <laughs> I mean, it says well, verification not, and, and have, have we falsified your definition? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a verification's on there. That's kind of the same thing. Um, so, in relation to this, you also have uh, the scientific method. Now, obviously, as you guys know, there's not one specific scientific method. Um, it depends on really much on the field you're looking at. But something like this is is generally the sort of thing we're talking about. You're asking a question. You're doing some research, proposing a hypothesis, developing an experiment performing that experiment and then analyzing the results to see if it supports or um, falsifies your hypothesis and then you know if your hypothesis is falsified you go back and start again and when you uh, get your hypothesis is not falsified you you publish your results and share them with others and that's generally the process of how a lot of science works and, and science um, buddies is a credible resource i think science buddies is a great <laughs> great resource I, it's, it's where i got the, the image from i like i like i like this picture um but then of course we come to the question of science denial so what what is science denial so the definition i've got here is taken from um the aforementioned work of uh d time and mckee uh, and their definition is that science denial is the employment of rhetoric, ret rhetorical arguments to give the appearance of legitimate debate where there is none, an approach that has been has the ultimate goal of rejecting a pro proposition on which a scientific census exists. Sorry, it's very small on my screen. I can't read, <laughs> read what it says. Um, so, of course, someone who is a science denier would be someone who is um, using rhetorical arguments to reject propositions on which they're uh, scientific consensus exists, such as uh, do vaccines work? What's the shape of the earth? You know, um, is HIV a thing? Um, that sort of stuff. So and we're going to go through. And, oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. What, it, what it sounds like to me is that it's 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 not so much being like science agnostic as saying like, well, who knows um, whether vaccines work? I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. But it's actually it's somebody who's m misappropriating. Um, yes, yes. Sciencyness in order to undermine 
scientific consensus. Yes, it, it, yeah, you're completely right. So um, it is, I mean, for example, take, you know, take the subject of vaccines. There are definitely people who are, who you'd call vaccine, vaccine skeptical, who might go, you know, so for example, the, the COVID vaccine, oh, did it have enough testing? Do we know what the long-term symptoms are? There? You know, I'm gonna you know, not get it until you know, um, the, the evidence is in, who are very different from um, you know, anti-vax people who are like, vaccines are always dangerous you know, uh, across the board. You know, they're some kind of mind control experiments. You know, they're putting chips in us and stuff like that. It's a very different, different mindset. But yeah, a, a denier is very much, you are, literally rejecting the evidence on something for which there is a consensus within mainstream science. And, and uh, I think as people that label ourselves as skeptics, there is an, that is an interesting point in that a lot of a lot of people who are actually denialists, denialers, deniers, yeah, on a, <laughs> on a topic, label themselves as skeptics. It, I know there has been some there has been some sort of discussion within the community as to whether or not the the label skeptic has been essentially poisoned by that practice. Do people when they hear that we are skeptics go, oh, so you're really really uncertain about that science thing? Like, no, 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 no. We're, we're the people defending that science thing. Scientific but, skeptics. Well, and yeah. I, I think I've, I've, I've said that, and I've had people go, "Oh, that's strange. I thought you, I thought you were, um, I thought you were really quite a sciencey person." Like, yeah, no, I am. It's science with it's skepticism with science, not skepticism of science. Well, but I think like the the sort of the professional science communicators, like like speaking of anti-vax things that we've heard a lot about, you know, in the last couple of years. Um, I think that the the sort of professionals who are working to improve the communication around that they talk they use the term vaccine hesitancy mm. to describe that group of people rather than rather than skeptics i think because you know potentially like like skepticism like has a has a whole package of meaning that that may or may not apply to that group of people regardless of whether that's the way that we would use the word skeptic so i think i think the term the term hesitancy hesitancy is used more for that group of people who are sort of benignly reluctant as opposed to the people who are actively undermining the science or attempting to undermine the science yes yes very well put yes um so anyway tonight we're going to be talking about the uh flick model i showed you a sort of the um acronym earlier there is a lot more to it so this is the sort of expanded flick model we're going to try and cover a, a fair amount of it tonight but we're not going to go into detail on all of it because as you can see there's there's quite a lot of it um so if we're going to sure start sort of induction <laughs> we'll we'll get to that one we we no, definitely no. will get to them. at least it's not koala induction so that, that would be the worst kind so um we're going to start with fake experts so uh, a fake expert is not necessarily someone you know um dressing up in a lab coat pretending to be a scientist that sort of thing Generally, what we mean when we're talking about fake experts is someone who is not an expert in the topic being discussed. So, for example, you might have someone who is a doctor, you know, they have a medical degree, they're very intelligent, probably top of their field in their job. But if they're talking about global warming, they're, they're a fake expert, they're not an expert in that field. And so, um, you know, they don't, that they, they don't really count them. What, what you see a lot in um, sort of science denial areas is people who are these fake experts. They may have expertise in one area, but they're too often talking about areas that, which they don't apply. So do you guys recognize any of these people? Do you? I definitely recognize the face of the middle guy. That's a face that's difficult to forget. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll, we'll start with um, the uh, top left, I think it is. Uh, the top left is Dr. David Mer Menton. He's a uh, has a PhD in biology and um, has uh, his research was looking at uh, fatty acid deficiencies and the the effect they had on the body. He um, is recognised as an expert in human anatomy and teaches that um, at university hospitals. Um, he also works for Answers in Genesis and spends a lot of his time talking about the age of the earth uh why birds are not dinosaurs things like that um which are not areas related to 
medicine and human anatomy. So he is, in those areas, a fake expert. He's been par paraded as a PhD in biology and a doctor, um, but he's talking about things where his expertise don't apply. Um, the chap below him with the little dinosaur is uh, John Morris Pendleton. Um, he died a couple of years ago, so he um, he was a chemical engineer. And again, he's one of these people who used to uh, make YouTube videos and stuff talking about um, why evolution is false. Um, and interestingly enough, why dinosaurs are still alive today. Um, and he's got one to prove it. And he has got one. Um, he was one of these people who would wear a lab coat. He would come on with a, with a lab coat, literally dressing up as a fake scientist in order to talk about uh, topics like this. Um, the one in the middle is, uh, I think his name is Christopher Monkton. I think that's how it's pronounced. I probably got that wrong. Um, he's a journalist, uh, a conservative, conservative political advisor. Uh, he was also a UKIP political candidate. Um, but he's also very well known for his anti-climate change um, things. He get, he does a lot of presentations about why climate change isn't happening. And um, and again, you know, he may be very good at his job, but he's not a climate scientist. He is a fake expert. And That's lastly, a the last one he is, he is, I know that he one. is a Viscount. The, the last one is Dr. 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 Dino, uh, Kent Hovind, who um, isn't a doctor, despite what he, he may go on about. He has he paid um, good money for that qualification. Yes, he, he does. He has he has a <laughs> um, a doctorate from an unaccredited diploma mill um, in Christian education, which he thinks um, makes him uh, qualified to talk about well, pretty much anything to do with science. You know, Big Bang didn't happen evolution is false climate change is wrong he claims to be an, have been a science teacher at one point as well doesn't yes he? yes Which he does scares the hell out of me yes yeah um interestingly enough if you if you ever want uh, a good laugh i would recommend looking up his um phd thesis online um it is available and it starts with hello my name is kent hovind which I, as people who have written PhDs in the group here know that that's how mine, we always start. Mine did not. Do you want me to check Erica's one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Check. Does it, does it start with hello? Does it start hello, my name's, name's Kent Oven. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's how they should all start. She, she's plagiarized it a bit. Exactly. Really Just, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Investigated dietary change in Roman and medieval Europe circa. Yeah, it's very boring. So, yes. <laughs> so anyway, so we have fake Ken, Ken Hogan's isn't, it's very entertaining you should definitely read it it, if you it is chance. entertaining yes i've got a copy on my computer <laughs> what, um, what i will say is that my, my phd does contain a reference to both harry potter and settlers of Catan. <laughs> nice yeah. um so yes there's this kind of fake experts but then there's also um things that are a little bit more insidious like this um this advert i think it's from 1940s um for viceroy filtered cigarettes um, with your dentist recommending that you smoke Viceroy's because what, what? You know, your dentist is definitely the best person to be giving you advice on the effects of smoking. Um, if, if you're going to lie, why not lie better than this? Exactly. So again, so this is, this is um, an example of a fake expert. They're parading the idea of a dentist um, as an expert in something, but they're not really, he's not, not talking about something in which he's an expert in. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's even a real dentist, to be honest. I'm not sure he might he <laughs> might be a cartoon. Then it's, it's possible. But the well, there's also they also kind of get round it by going well, rather than actually asking, does it matter? I mean, we touched on this in, in my uh, my statistics one. It's like oh, eight out of ten dentists agree. And it's like yeah, but eight, eight out of ten dentists agree with like lots of things it's not also like eight out of ten canadians agree that hockey is the national sport like who are these other two people <laughs> so um with along with fake experts the you, you can take it a step further and that's the idea of bulk fake experts which is when you have a large number of people put forwards as experts on something in order to start cast doubt on the uh, prevailing opinion. So, for example, do any of you remember this? The scientific descent from Darwinism. No. So this is this is something that was put out by the Discovery Institute in 2001. 
Um, and it was essentially this statement here. We are skeptical of the claims of the ability for random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwin's theory should be encouraged. Hands up if you agree with that. Well, I was going to say, there's nothing wrong on the yeah, Facebook. There's absolutely we nothing. We were all doing that back in, in 1856 or whatever. Exactly. There's, there's nothing to disagree with about that. And they put this out and they basically said, if you're a scientist come and you agree with this, come and sign our petition, petition sign this statement. And um, uh, they got a lot of people signing up for it. Um, now, as you can imagine, they, 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 there was um, not all of those people were were relevant scientists, which brings me on to the sort of link to the, the, the next thing, which is the idea of um, magnified minority. So if you have a look at this, I don't know if you can see that. It's tiny on my screen. No, there's um, a lot of names, though. You, you'll have people on there. Oh, I can see if I can do the laser pointer. Yeah, here we go. Awesome. So you've got people here like this person has a PhD in biochemistry. And there's one down here as a professor of biology and cell biology and stuff. And that's all great. You know, these are these are people who you'd expect to have a, a strong grasp on uh, evolution and stuff like that. But you also have a oh, mathematical physics. scientist and physics geology physics. and computer science. And is, is there one there that says senior scientist? Senior scientist, yeah. <laughs> there's one here which just oh, says excellent. staff scientist. Um, and these are not people who are... Um, necessarily experts in this area and so when you look at this list there by between 2001 and 2019 they gathered a thousand signatures and they were putting this out there look at look here's a thousand scientists who have signed this list basically saying they have problems with darwinism um now there was a little bit of pushback on on this um and do you guys uh, remember the dover kitzmiller trial when um they was it was about, about teaching young earth creation and uh, not creation sorry intelligent design as an alternative to evolution in um public schools um as part of that they wanted to offer a counter for this because they knew this that this sort of thing would come up in the trial and so they put a scientific support for Darwinism petition together. And in four days, they got 7,733 signatures. So almost eight times as many as the other group got in eight years. Well, wasn't there one um, where they just got scientists called Stephen to yes, sign? Yes, Project it? Steve. Um, <laughs> Project <laughs> Steve was, an, was another one, which um, by 2017 had 1,412 signatures, all of people who worked specifically in relevant fields to evolution and all who had to have a name that was some derivation of Steve. So th what you can see from this is very easily that, you know, you look at this in, in isolation of 1,000 people have signed this petition. But if you compare it to the actual figures out there, for example, um, in 2017, there were approximately 955,000 scientists in the US working in related fields to evolution. Um, of, the seven, of the 700 names that were at a time on this list, only a quarter of them were working in relevant fields, which meant it was 0.01% of the relevant people who were you know, in the position to talk about this. Um, but yes, so that's that's uh, bulk fake experts and magnified minority. It's it's making it look like more people are against an idea than they actually are. Um, we then have the topic of fake debates and false balance, and um, I'm sure uh, a lot of you have, you've come across this. It's the um, Darren O'Brien has a is it Darren O'Brien has the the joke recently you know, talking about we're talking about the shape of the Earth and we brought someone on from the Flat Earth Society to talk about it. Um, there's been a lot of concern about this. People have written papers on it. I've got an example here of the dangerous balance annexe about presenting two sides of an argument as equal. The media like to do this an awful lot. Um, in fact, the BBC got in trouble for it in uh, 2013 uh, regarding their coverage of uh, climate change, where they were bringing in people who were skeptics of climate change to offer the idea of a balanced approach when literally you're talking the overwhelming scientific consensus of 99.9% .9 of people on say it's happening and the 0.1% say it's not. And it's it's not the same thing. Bringing these people on uh, 
as a level thing that is creates the idea of false balance. I remember uh, seeing a debate on climate science a long time ago on TV, and they had like the one climate scientist that disagrees. And against him, they had a meteorologist who agreed with climate change. And at the end of the debate, the presenter said, well, he's a climate scientist. You're just a meteorologist. So I'm going to agree with him. Well, why yeah. did you choose those two people? Yes. <laughs> Could you not find another one? Um, so yes, that's that's F. Let's move on to L. Wait, wait, L before is we go, before we go back, Ooh. something I want to talk about: um, fake experts. Because um, while I was researching the uh, white genocide a while back, um, I discovered this fascinating microsystem that exists. So there's these six or seven academics who are scientific racists or race scientists, whatever you want to call them. And they all get funding from the same endowment and they all publish in the same peer reviewed journal and they all review each other's work for that journal and they all cite each other's work. So you get this, this system where they, if you just look at it briefly, you see these people are uh, being funded to they're being cited to they're being published in peer reviewed journals and it all looks very legitimate, but it's the same six or seven people doing the same things. Yeah. <laughs> Who, what else right. is published in that journal? Is it just them? Well, publishing? It, is, it is just them. It is just them publishing. Their... So no one outside of them is seeking to publish in their journal. It sounds no. a bit no like the answers should. in Genesis <laughs> and stuff like oh, that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just right. So uh, what have I clicked? There we go. Logical fallacies. So I won't go through all of these. There's uh, there's quite a few of them. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of what some of these logical fallacies are. So like the ad hom is basically what is when blowfish? you're. Blowfish. Uh, I don't think I actually go into detail on the blowfish. Blowfish is basically a very targeted version of the red herring, where you're very, you know, rather than distracting them with um, sort of a generality, you're very specifically targeting a very detailed aspect of something in order to derail the conversation. I don't think I know enough about marine biology to understand like, <laughs> what the red herring metaphor is doing, and therefore I can't understand why the blowfish <laughs> metaphor is different. So um, let's start with looking at uh, sort of misrepresentations and straw men. So um, as I'm sure you guys know, a straw man argument is effectively you misrepresent an argument someone's making in order to make it easier for you to defeat. So here is a, a few examples. Um, in the center there, we have the crocoduck, which I'm uh, sure some of you have come across, which is the often put forward by creationists and saying, you know, if evolution happened, why don't we see things like this in the fossil record? Um, you know, we've never seen one kind of animal turn into another kind of animal, therefore evolution is false. Well, yes, based on cladistics, we wouldn't expect to see that, so that's perfectly fine. Um, the old flat earth one of uh, globe earthers claiming that the earth should curve eight inches per mile squared but we this isn't what we see well no because that would form a parabola not a circle it's uh you know a lot of a lot of these are, are uh, things that you may have come across and basically they're misrepresentations of the scientific position that are easy easy to put down because they are actually wrong so it's quite easy to knock down something that's actually wrong but it's not what the science is actually saying so uh that's straw men um Ambiguity is is another uh, common one, uh, which which where you have a lot in this sort of thing is where people use words differently. So like the evolution is just a theory. And that's because in common parlance, theory is just a guess or a you know I have an idea or a hunch about something. Whereas in science, what we're talking about is a well-established body of evidence that um, has withstood the test of time. And you know it has predictive power. You know explains all the facts and stuff like that. We're not just talking about a guess someone just had. Um, I, I, I cannot tell you how often at work I'm asked to be okay. Well, can you statistically prove that something something something? I was like, well, no, that's not how statistics works. It provides exactly. evidence. It doesn't provide proof. Okay, exactly. Like, Science oh, doesn't deal with proof. Oh, we statistically prove it. No. We have generated strong evidence for exactly exactly um there's um uh, summerfield and hassel uh, in 2011 put together a paper where they um 
just looked at terms within climate science that are used differently within climate science to how they use in uh, general conversation. And obviously, this can cause confusion. Um, but uh, it, it, it also can be used by uh, honest people to sort of misrepresent the arguments and stuff by, um, you know, misrepresenting what the words are actually meaning when people uh, use them. Um, so it's sort of a good one, for example, where, uh, where was the one I was going to use? Uncertainty is a, is a good one. So um, uncertainty, when we talk about that in everyday conversation, we're talking about, well, I'm not really sure, we don't know, it could be anything. Whereas in climate science, when they use the word uncertainty, they mean the range of values they're discussing. So if you have you have an uncertainty, say, between one and 10, and it's somewhere within that range, but that's a set range that you've produced your evidence for and you know, uh, can back up. So it's not just, you know, we don't know. Um, next, we have uh, the single cause fallacy. And this is basically the idea that if a cause has been shown for something in the past, then it, you know, it, it, that is the only cause that can be. So exactly here we have here, people died before uh, of cancer before cigarettes, therefore cigarettes can't cause cancer. Um, and a more real world example is this quote from Marco Rubio, who's a Republican politician, who's basically saying, you know, um, humans are not responsible for climate change uh, because the climate has changed in the past naturally. So the implication being because it changed naturally in the past, it must be changing naturally now which is an example of the uh, single cause fallacy. Okay, so uh, let's move on to letter I. So I stands for impossible expectations. Um, so I'm going to do some, uh, before we go into the actual looking at what impossible expectation examples are, um, I'm going to ask you guys to think about, so Erica, for example, has done her PhD. And you, you did a lot of research and stuff like that. Um, and so my question is, is, how would you go about demonstrating the thesis of your PhD to somebody? So for example, this on the screen is my master's experiment, essentially. So in my master's degree, I um, showed people a magic trick. And what they, what they, it was a very simple trick. Someone would throw a ball up in the air a couple of times, and then they pretend to throw it up and it would disappear because they wouldn't actually throw up. And what I did is I, I wired people up to an eye tracking software so I could see exactly where they were looking. And I asked them to tell me where on, a, on an image I took of the final thing, what they last thought they saw the, the ball. Um, I then got them to carry out a, a number of questionnaires on paranormal belief. And I found that people with higher levels of paranormal belief strongly correlate with people who are more taken in by this trick. They yeah. reported seeing the ball disappear off the top of the screen when it didn't, or and their eye tracking showed that that's where they were looking um, at the time. This is way so more if, interesting than my, my reason. <laughs> so if someone was to say to me, you know, okay, um, how would you demonstrate to me your, your research? Well, what I would do is I'd go over to the bookshelf over there, pull out my master's thesis, hand it to them and say, read it, uh, which I imagine is what you would do with yours, Erica. I mean, I wouldn't torture people no. uh, to, to that extent. Uh, I'd probably find like a more succinct way to to give them the information. And by the way, the, um, the, the summary of my PhD is that the Romans may or may not have eaten a lot of fish. <laughs> And Good for some reason, they never published anything related to that. For some reason. So, what what would you say if if you got this response then? That's ah. just words on paper. Well, so, this, that's, so this... that's what I was thinking is like I can't demonstrate it because no. they're all dead, and <laughs> the way that I found out is by taking their bones and incinerating them at a high temperature and running them through a mass spectrometer. And there's like, there's, there are so many um, chains of assumption and reasoning that are involved in going from that ultimate hypothesis of did they or did they not even eat, eat a lot of fish? And there's how do you even frame that, right? There's all of that. But, but going from, you know, the, even let's say I get a number at the end, 
which allows me to make a value judgment about is this a lot or a little. How I even get that number is based on, I would guess, like between 10 and 20 assumptions about, you know, the chemistry that's going on, um, about the, the, in, like the individual that I am studying, where that came from, this, like that whole thing. Um, and I cannot prove that to somebody who, who was not there in the room with me. Like, you know, like the whole thing is like, you keep handwritten notes of your lab work for, for that purpose. Yeah. But ultimately, um, it is entirely possible to be accused of um, tampering. And we've had this in, in a similar chemical procedure. Um, it's been an issue when radiocarbon dating is happening, which like chemically is very similar to the, the work that I was doing for my research, where um, the procedures have to include a bunch of protocols to um, ensure that contamination isn't taking place. But science deniers have also used any kind of gaps in, in the kind of radiocarbon dating process as a way of um, attacking the, the results that they disagree with. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same. If someone was to say to me, no, that your, your dissertation is just words on paper, show me a demonstration of your research. Well, I would have to redo all the research. I'd have to get all the people back in, get them to re-sit in the eye test and have the person sit there and watch me, which just isn't practical. It isn't how science works. Well, so although the, reproducibility is a feature of science. Yes. And I think science works, we all think that science works better when there is more reproducibility yes. being tested. But um, okay, so so yes, they would have to probably carry out the research themselves. But yeah. if you're going to literally dismiss all scientific evidence in journals as just yeah. words on paper. So the example I have on the screen here is from a uh, recent uh, video on uh, Fight the Flat Earth's uh, YouTube channel where I had a discussion with a lady called uh, Rachie Five Zeros, and they were talking about gravity. And so um, Craig, who is the presenter on that uh, show, brought up a number of examples. So the first thing we have over here is um, a gravimeter, I don't know what it's actually called. It's uh, a device which is used to um, find minerals under the ground by like oil companies and that lot by um, testing the different gravitational effects. So obviously if there's a, a body of something under the earth, it's gonna produce a stronger gravitational um, attraction than if there isn't. And there are countless papers and stuff for this. The second example is submarines that use um, changes in gravity in order to navigate undersea mountains and stuff so if you're you're wanting to go along and you don't want to use your sonar because you're being all stealthy you can literally detect the different gravitational attraction between of the area around you in order to avoid objects and lastly there are hundreds of thousands of papers on gravity Rachi just went no those are just words on paper you have to show me someone finding minerals with a gravimeter. You have to show me a submarine navigating based on gravity. You know, right now in the debate, <laughs> and obviously that's that's an impossible expectation. That's not something that it's, it's possible to do. And it's um, somewhat unrealistic. Um, now related to impossible expectations, there's a specific example of moving the goalposts. And this is actually, uh, I've paraphrased slightly because I couldn't actually find which video it was, but this was from another uh, of Fight the Flat Earth's um, recent videos where he was discussing um, the existence of space with somebody. And so the, uh, the Flat Earther said, well, show me a rocket traveling all the way from the ground into space. So he quickly brought one of these up because there's plenty out there and showed it. Well, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to see a rocket go all the way into space, turn around and come back and land again. Uh, okay, give me a moment. Right, here you go, we watch that. No, 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 what I want is a rocket going all the way into space, going round the moon and coming back. It was, well, I'm not sure that's available. We, I don't think we have that. Well, then you have nothing. You can't, you can't support your claims. You, know, you haven't got the specific piece of information that I want now after moving the goalposts multiple times to get to something you don't have, therefore you have nothing. 
and this is a, this is a common sort of tactic that comes up in science denial. It's you know once the evidence is presented to you of something that you are asked for, thinking they wouldn't have, you rather than acknowledge that, you just move on to something else that they probably can't present you with. And um, uh, Sheldon in the chat has just uh, pointed out, of course. Well, if it's just words on paper, that's just a video. Yeah, the same, the same <laughs> argument applies. Yes, yes. So that's even if you did have that available. Exactly. I, I, I mean, that, that is um, a very, uh, very good point. Um, one of the main responses you get to these things is you show them a video of exactly what they asked for, and they say, CGI, it's fake. You know, you can't prove to me that that video isn't fake. That it, it is, it's, it comes back to the, the, what we were talking about just a, at the moment ago, you know, saying some, you know, saying that submarines all over the world use this technology every day. And there's thousands of submariners who have done this sort of thing. That's not enough. If you can't show me a submarine right now, while we're talking, doing this it doesn't happen. So if you can't show me a rocket going into space for real right now, the videos don't count. So. Do you think it would be worth it to crowdfund sending somebody who ardently believes in flat Earth on like a right. SpaceX rocket? And then leaving them up there. And then we don't necessarily convince them, but are we not entertained? Uh, <laughs> no, I, there's, there's that mad guy who built his own, who was like a flat earther, who he built died? his own rocket in... Yeah, he died. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. yeah. But he, you know, he was just going, you know, he was shooting himself up and up and up, and he was still like, nah, it's flat. The, the, the problem but yeah, I mean, even if you convince one person, then all the rest of the community are going to say, oh, he was a shill all along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 that's exactly how it happens. Any any time you have, because there's a lot of, um, for those of you who, like me, follow the Flat Earth community for some bizarre nope, reason. that's just you. It's just me, isn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> There are there are quite a, a number of people in that community who are very prominent names. You know, they were the people everybody else would reference as, you know, he's the guy who's got all the evidence, you know, who have now since turned around and gone, yeah, I was wrong. I've looked at the evidence wrong and I've it doesn't support flat earth. The earth is a globe. And of course, you know, they were never a real flat earther. They're just a shill. You know, they were they were just controlled opposition, made, you know, trying to trick people into with bad arguments even though they still use the arguments these people put forward, they just dismiss the source of them. So, which is actually another uh, logical fallacy doing, <laughs> doing that. So um, we're up to, we've done I, let's move on to the first of the C's. And that is, I am not clicked on the screen Hello. yet. That is not working. Why? Drum roll. There you go, <laughs> cherry picking, yay. So um, yeah, cherry picking. Uh, so cherry picking is basically where you select data that appears to confirm one position while ignoring the vast majority of data that actually goes against your position. Um, so um, I'm going to use uh, this uh, as an example. This is... Uh, yes, this is an example of cherry picking. So. Um, <laughs> This uh, is a uh, example that like uh, a lot of young Earth creationists like to use as an argument against radiometric dating. So um, in uh, 1980, uh, Mount St. Helens erupted. And over the next six years, um, it formed a, a number of lava domes um, as a result of the eruption. Now, uh, in 1993, geologist Dr. Steve Austin, who I assume must be you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> I, I, um, I was reading the connection. Yeah. Uh, is he went and did some work on this, and he's he's uh, a creationist, and he got uh, some samples from these lava domes, uh, which at the time were like 13 years old, and he sent them off for potassium argon dating. And despite the fact that they're only 13 years old, the results they got back showed that they were between. 340,000 and 2.8 million years old. So clearly, radiometric dating cannot be trusted. We should throw it all out and just assume that the Earth is 6,000 years old based on adding up the ages of people in the Bible. So um, I, I was going to ask Erica, because she had some experience from radiometric dating, what was possible cause of this may have been? Well, so my first question is, 
well, okay, before I get to my question, um, can we just talk about the graph, the, 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 the data visualization here? Because it implies that there is some order on the horizontal axis that somehow there's a zone dome L, dome one, one L, one M, one H, one P, that they're somehow in, in an order. They are not in order. They are just arranged in date order. This is the wrong way to display this. Sam, data. this is one of Sam's misleading graphs, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's not just misleading. It's, it's like, it's it's more like it's, it's implying something that is not relevant. <laughs> like the next time we date something, it's gonna be 12 billion years old. Oh my God, it's exponentially increasing. It doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. But my question is, can you can you say again, what was the thing that they dated? Um, some bits of freshly formed rock from the lava dome. Okay. because. I mean, I'm not I'm not a rock person, but <laughs> what what's what's really important is to make sure that when we're dating something, we can be really certain that it dates to the event of interest, and it is possible to have bits of extraneous material yes. that are introduced. Um, yes. So so um, which is which is um, the uh, the things called xenoliths, which is one of these. Nope, sorry, one of okay. these, um, <laughs> which is basically pieces of rock trapped inside other rocks. So in the case of the Mount St. Helens uh, eruption, there were rocks that were not liquefied by the eruption. Which like, you so, would 100% be able to tell yes, as, exactly. a, as a geologist. Like, well, is it black with tiny holes or is it something else? Well, well, just like, just like, like, as in like, it's the difference between like, um, let's say that you like, put a bowl of melted ice cream back in the freezer versus like the original unmelted ice cream. Like you can tell, even though they're both now frozen, you can tell that one of them has has melted and has like a totally different crystal structure. Yes. And so in, in this case, what um, one of the things that was happening was there were bits of rock that were not liquefied and which were millions of years old trapped inside this newly formed rock. And so when they dated them, they got, um, dates in the millions of years range. Uh, of course, there's also the uh, thing of uh, the error bars on things like potassium argon dating. Which dating. there were none on the previous visualization, just to add to my criticism. Exactly. <laughs> um, which, um, you know, it's it's not designed to test things 13 years old. It's going to always give you an error of hundreds of thousands of years, because that's what it's designed to test. Um, so, you know, when you when you have something designed to test millions of years range, which has error bars several tens of thousands of years wide, and you test something 13 years old, you're not going to get a 13-year-old result. Um, another thing I wanted to sort of uh, show with the cherry picking idea is this graph here. Now, it's, it's going to run through a couple of times. It runs really quick, so I can't talk about it all quickly. Um, so this is a graph of temperature changes over time. Um, and sort of, so the global surface temperature change. And you can see that if we look at the graph as a whole, which is when it comes up with the red line across it, that there has definitely been an increase in global surface temperature over time. However, if you select certain parts of it, such as 1970 to 1978, or 1978 to 1980 seven i think it is you can see that those individual sections of it are demonstrate that there's either been no uh, global surface increase or actually a decrease so if you were uh, uh, a somewhat less than a trustworthy person and you wanted to say that global warming isn't happening well you could take these sections of the graph in isolation and show look here we are here's measurement from 2003 to 2012, which shows that global temperatures are actually going down. Well, do you even get like a headline like like 2012 is the coldest year since like 2003 or something, right? And that like that would be just some headline that they that you could throw out. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it's very much about um, you know picking the data that wants to tell that tells the story you want to tell, rather than looking at all the data. And it's, it's something to actually look out for when you're dealing with um, people who are taking, say, the fringe position on a scientific thing. Well, yeah, like and they say, that. look at this data. Well, how much data they're presenting? Oh, look, here's data for a single year. You know, um, I was uh, watching a video earlier where they were talking about uh, 
crime statistics, which isn't you know necessarily science denial, but you had um, an original paper which looked over several decades, and then the paper that wanted to show that immigration was the cause of crime increase, which just looked at a single year, ignoring yeah. all the, the the increase in crime over the previous decades. That's and then was like, as this graph is showing, like the huge amount of variability year on year. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you 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 have all this sort of thing going on, but. Um, so uh, let's move on to. Um, oh, hang on! I've got my pieces of paper out of order. That's never a good thing. Is it uh, slothful induction? It is slothful induction. Oh. We're going to move on to <laughs> slothful induction. Um, but we're doing it slowly. We're going to do it very slowly. I'm, I'm pushing. I'm pushing the button. It's, yeah, there we go. So slothful induction. So slothful induction is kind of the opposite of cherry picking it's basically ignoring the relevant evidence when it comes to Ooh. making a conclusion so uh kent hovin uh, sorry dr kent hovin um is a great one for this he likes to uh state almost on anything he's on talking about the subject that there is absolutely no evidence for evolution you know he has a a, a twenty five thousand dollar prize where he says can show me empirical evidence for evolution because he says there's absolutely none it's all just religious belief um which is obviously nonsense it, it, it it's nonsense whatever way you look at it so i have this picture of a butler on the screen to, to, to which I, which i'm hoping demonstrates my my point let's say there's a crime a murder uh, agatha christie style murder at a mansion and um they find the butler's fingerprints on the knife. Now, would you agree that that is evidence that the butler could have been the murderer? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've read a lot of Agatha Christie. Yes. Okay, cool. So let's say we now decisively and conclusively show that the butler was not the murderer. He was not even in the house at the time. He was down the road buying kippers. Does that those fingerprints on the knife stop being evidence? That he could have committed that he committed the crime it's still no, evidence. it's still evidence, it's still evidence. Yeah. so so my my problem with ken is well my, one of my many 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 <laughs> problems with ken is that even if evolution is entirely false radiometric dating the fossil record dna uh, endogenous retroviruses these are still evidence for evolution even if the conclusion that evolution happens is false. In the same way, the fingerprints on the knife are still evidence that the butler killed someone, even if we know for sure that he didn't. Well, and in some ways, this this example seems like a straw man. Like, he just set up a straw man of, well, this is how proving proving me wrong would work, when that's not at all how proving him wrong would work. And that if he was doing this in good faith, he would have been proving wrong. Yes, also exactly. So one of one of my favorite scientific experiments that is currently active anyway um, is the long term uh, evolutionary experiment using E. coli. So this has been running since before I was born. Um, so 1988, it started. Uh, and basically what they do is every day they take samples of, of or they'll um, basically got lots and lots of uh, um, containers. It's got basically like a sugary solution in it, and E. coli is in there. It, you know, it's just living its best life. And what they'll do is they'll do, every day they will take take a tiny amount, develop it on a petri dish, take one bacteria, drop it in a new container, let it grow. And so basically, what they're doing is each day they they're basically selecting one survivor from each beaker to then go on and, and become. Um, become the next generation. Is this survival random? Yes. Or is there some kind of fitness test that it has no, it's, it's, Well, the only fitness is how quickly they can grow in that beaker in okay. the next generation. And the interesting thing is that basically they've got, they, they have been creating random mutations that have got them a bit better and a bit better and a bit better. In terms of like the number of bacteria that they're producing each day, they are so much fitter for this particular solution that they're producing um that it's it's you know it's a clear clear evidence of evolution there's also in there quite an interesting um step or demonstration of how you can have one change which suddenly creates a massive leap 
And so basically at one point, one of the strains figured out how to not just eat the sugar solution, but also one of the other chemicals is in there as some sort of stabilizer or something. That it was, you know, it was, it was in there. It wasn't intended as food, but the E. coli figured out how to eat it and suddenly pfft, this particular strain got much more competitive. Um, and it's clear, it's, you know, it's clear evidence of evolution. It's happening in front of our eyes. It's been going on for, you know, 35, approaching 35 years now. But it's a really, really clear example of evolution. And they, free, they freeze periodic samples. And so after they noticed this, because actually it made the solution cloudy, like there was a there was a way of like going, oh yeah, that's that's one that's right, just from looking at it. They went back and they pulled it again and found actually that when they put it back in, this you know from the same strain, the same evolution occurred. But actually, if they went back to the previous strain, the same evolution didn't occur. So it was a it was clearly a build up of various mutations, and that the strains that you know went back to a bit before that evolution occurred, it clearly had enough of the markers. To then be able to make that jump again hmm. but in other strains actually they, they didn't they were they were just lacking there were there were so many there were several things that had to evolve in order for it to happen and um but yeah it's Can very clear ask, like, why are we trying to make super super e coli <laughs> well, the... no, it's, it's not it's super e coli. Just hate us. it's just e coli <laughs> it's e coli that's really good at living in this one specific okay place. which like presumably like jurassic park style like does not exist in the wild therefore this e coli is not going to break out and take over the world no, unless no. they're all female. life finds a way exactly <laughs> No, if, if anything, they're getting less fit for the outside environment because they're amazing, getting amazing. Like, Oh, so it's That's clearly an example that. of devolution then. So not actually evolution. <laughs> yes. Okay, right. So all makes sense now. Kent's yeah. happy. You know, he can dismiss your evidence. Yeah. Um, okay, so on to the next bit, um, which is quote mining. Now, I, I found this out especially for uh, Sam. He likes uh, this one. Koalas? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, the, my, my discoveries are useless is taken out of context. Scientists claims discoveries are useless. So uh, quote mining is literally taking a person's word out of context in order to misrepresent their beliefs. Um, a very, very famous example of this that shows up all the time is this one here. Uh, mm. Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species says to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. So creationists will often come out and say, see, Darwin himself said evolution was absurd. He didn't even believe it. And yet, if you read The Origin of Species, the very next paragraph is him going on to explain that if we look at nature and can see that small changes can be useful in different environments and that, you know, it, it, that these things can add up and be passed on to successive generations, then it doesn't matter how absurd it may seem. It's it happens. It, it the, you know the evidence is there, and but of course they don't show that bit. They just show the 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 bit where he uh, seems to agree with the uh, position that evolution is absurd. Okay, so. Um, Let's move on from the first C to the second C, which is the reason we're all got our tinfoil hats on today. Uh, conspiracy wait, theory. What? What? Wait. Have you guys been conspiring behind my back? Exactly. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> the alien rays are going to be taking over your brain. I'm sorry about that. Um, now, we've talked a lot about conspiracies on this channel um, before. Um, if you want to go have a look in more depth about the topic of conspiracy theories, we have another video on it called Cambridge Skeptics Discuss Conspiracy Theories. And we're also going to be talking about conspiracy theories next time as well. So we talk about this a lot. Um, so what is a but conspiracy? Why? <laughs> it's a conspiracy. We, we get paid to by the man. Um, so what are conspiracy theories? Well, uh, uh, Douglas et al. defines conspiracy theories as uh, explanations for important events that involve secret plots by powerful and nefarious groups. Um, so there's, a, as I'm just going to jump back a slide, as you can see, there's a lot of um, things about related to conspiracy theories. We're not going to look at all of them. Um, first one we're going to have a look at is the idea of overriding suspicion. So. With overriding suspicion, you're looking at uh, the idea that 
um, people have an unreasonable level of skepticism to tweet before uh, towards the official account. You know, it basically prevents their belief in anything that isn't the conspiracy theory. So, you know, here's some evidence the Earth is is a globe. Well, you know, that's just being put out there. And, you know, we can't trust that. We, we have to be really skeptical of that. But here's evidence of something else uh, showing it's flat. Well, that we can just take on, take on board. Um, one example of or another example of this is 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 this thing here where basically every single one of the pictures that NASA produce is CGI and apparently they admit this and so the moon is fake space is fake the earth globe is fake all of this is fake NASA are just giving us CGI images it's all fake um, we also saw uh, an example of this earlier when we were talking about scientific papers are just words on paper it's literally, you know, every single scientist out there is actively lying to me. I cannot trust anything I'm reading from a scientist if it doesn't support what I already believe. So this is sort of an overriding um, suspicion of anything that goes against your conspiracy, which, which we see in a lot of these uh, things. Um, next up, we have nefarious intent. Um, and this is basically assuming that the motives behind the presumed conspiracy have to be nefarious. So uh, we've got some examples here. You know, the globe is all about paganism and the occult and satanic world control, whereas flat Earth is biblically supported, makes people special. You know, is getting undermining Satan, Satan's deceptions. Um, and you know, why would people lie about the uh, shape of the earth? Well, of course, it's to hide free energy, or you know, cut us off from God, or um, you know, keep their scientific findings for themselves. All of these, you know, stop people thinking they're special. All of these reasons are put forward because you know the people doing this, they can't just actually believe that the earth is a globe, is, is or have this... seen evidence that they think it is a globe. They have to be it, doing it on purpose. Like, did you find these on the internet? I like, did. I did. Like, so, so they're literally saying that, like, we need to make sure that we remember that we're all special, like we're six. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, that, okay. that's that's why the Earth is why you know when you when you look at the flat Earth, you know that God created it for us, which means we're special. Because, like, it is it is like a wonderful like argument or like facet of like you know understanding our our real place in the universe and like the journey that science has taken in the last two thousand years of like accepting that we're not special i just didn't know that like they were they were like they're saying the quiet part loud yeah <laughs> well if you remember Erica, when we looked at conspiracy theories one of the things we looked at was um how they can make people feel special you know, yeah the... and that's that's what i mean is like i thought but i thought it was like much more internalized like the fact that like they're calling it out is like this is the club for special people oh yes yeah yeah, uh, yeah they they see themselves as special and they see the beliefs they hold make them special um so yeah it's uh it's it's interesting but yeah um, wake up sheeple wake up sheeple <laughs> um so the last thing i want to talk about uh, under the conspiracy theories um is the idea of persecuted victims so putting yourself out there as the victim uh, does anybody remember this the ben stein expelled movie from 2008 yeah, what happened to him uh I, I don't care. <laughs> um, so this this was a movie put together um, to apparently investigate the idea that there's widespread persecution of educators and scientists who promote intelligent design and that there's a conspiracy that keeps God out of the classroom and the science labs. Um, it's nothing to do with the fact that intelligent design is bad science. It's all a conspiracy to suppress the truth for reasons, um, so um, yeah, so this is this is uh, an example we see in. Uh, so this one's specifically about sort of creationism and uh, intelligent design sort of uh, approach. You see this this sort of thing in lots of uh, um, anti-science groups. You know, the the anti-vaxxers are you know we're 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 so we're so put upon. Everyone's out to get us. You know. Um, just because we're saying the truth, you know, the flat earthers are very much, you know, we're going to stand up and say the truth against the lying people and, and Satan and all that. Well, lot. and on the vaccine side, like the, 
that that sentiment is fed when there are you know perfectly reasonable public health measures put in place to you know a, a restrict the ability of people who are not vaccinated to spread disease that you know when when that's happening that that furthers that that feeling that they have that they're being persecuted yes yes yeah i, I mean that's actually um I mean, there was, there's a number of other little points related to conspiracy theories, and one of them is the idea that um, basically any evidence against the conspiracy is evidence for the conspiracy. So, um, you know, when you're presenting them with evidence saying, you know, this is sensible things, you know, this this is, you know, there's there's a there's a pandemic, um, and here's some sensible things you can do to to avoid getting infected, or ah, okay, these things they're making us do. Are clearly part of the conspiracy to make us believe in this pandemic that's clearly false, and you know they all, all of the things is shown as evidence of the conspiracy. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. So uh, as I said before, the the acronym FLIC, which is fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories, is is a useful thing to keep in mind when when you encounter a uh, sort of fringe scientific claim. So are they presenting false experts? Are they using logical fallacies in the presentation of their information? Do they have impossible expectations they're expecting science to meet before they'll accept the, the consensus? Do they cherry pick their data? Um, and are they uh, making use of conspiracy theories um, to support their arguments? If they are, then you're most likely dealing with someone who is a science denier rather than sort of a genuine skeptic. And yeah, that's that's my lot. That was super good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what are we doing next? So uh, next time, Chris, do you want to explain? Yeah, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> will, you, will you bring a tinfoil hat? Sorry? Will you bring a tinfoil hat next time? I, I, I will not, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> we are so rejected. They're, Controlling really you, they're making you wear tinfoil hats. Exactly, <laughs> it's all the conspiracy. It's the hats. I'm <laughs> just doing the, the Illuminati things you know, as well. Right. The tinfoil actually intensifies the electrical fields. You... Ah, <laughs> it's like a dish; it reflects them all thing into your brain. <laughs> okay. He wasn't going to say anything more. It turns out that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, I think that's it. Unless anybody has any <laughs> questions um, or anything else they want to say, we'll uh, wrap up for the evening. See everyone next time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs>